Good morning and welcome to worship on this Pentecost Sunday. We're going to start off with a prayer this morning, but it's going to be a prayer that we all say together. So please join with me. O God, the Holy Spirit, come to us and among us. Come as the wind and cleanse us. Come as the fire and burn. Come as the dew and refresh. Convict, convert, and consecrate many hearts and lives to our great good and to thy greater glory. And this we ask for Jesus Christ's sake. Amen.
We are going to uh, pray for all the folks that we've been praying for. Um, I also want to say we want to make sure that we lift up the fact that we are finally going to have our high school graduation ceremony this Saturday, and so we're going to get to celebrate uh, with our graduates for that. Uh, keep praying for Carol Lowry, for Carolyn Lewis, um, for Lainey Clark and Kaylin Grice, uh, who are expecting babies. Um, and this morning, as I was thinking about what we needed to pray about, um, I really felt like we needed to pray from Psalm 51, which is David's prayer of confession. There's a lot of stuff going on in the world right now, um, and I really felt like God was saying that um, confession needs to start with us, and so I'm going to offer that as our prayer, um, just kind of changing the words a little bit to make it plural uh, for all of us. Um, but let's go uh, before the Lord in prayer. Have mercy on us, O God, according to your unfailing love. According to your great compassion, blot out our transgressions. Wash away all our iniquity and cleanse us from our sin. For we know that our transgressions and our sin is always before us. Against you, you only, have we sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So wash us, and hide your face from our sins, and blot out all of our iniquity. Create in us pure hearts, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within us. Do not cast us from your presence, or take your Holy Spirit from us. Restore to us the joy of your salvation, and grant us a willing spirit to sustain us. Then we will teach transgressors your ways, so that sinners will turn back to you. Deliver us, your people, from the guilt of bloodshed, O God, you who are God our Savior, and our tongues will sing of your righteousness. Open our lips, Lord, and our mouths will declare your praise. Our sacrifice to you, O God, is a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart, God, you will not despise. And now, Lord, hear us as we pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. All right, for our offering today, um, I want to remind you that you can give online, or you can give by mailing in your check, um, or if you're going to be with us uh, next week as we worship together, uh, then you can always bring your check with you um, and put it in the offering box then. Um, our offering prayer this morning is going to be given by Felicia Crawford, and so let's pray with her. Please pray with me. Holy Spirit, breathe into our lungs so that we may feel your peace with us. Holy Spirit, breathe into the lives of those people who are touched by the ministries of this church so they too may feel your peace. Holy Spirit, receive the outpouring of these generous gifts offered unto you. In the name of the one who first offered the gift of the Holy Spirit, we pray. Amen.
seven weeks ago was Easter Sunday, and to me that feels like a lifetime ago because so much has happened in the last two months. But seven weeks ago, I preached about, of course, what happened on that first Easter Sunday, about how Peter and John went to the empty tomb and how Mary Magdalene also went there and she encountered the risen Lord. But the other disciples weren't sure about all that and they were scared. And then I read this story from John chapter 20. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and sighed. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Now, I talked about how him um, going through his death and resurrection uh, you know, opened up a whole world of hope for those disciples. And I talked about how he, he busted in as a surprise. They weren't expecting him to be resurrected, but he was. And he not only burst into the room in, in some kind of mystical way, but he had also bursted through the gates of hell and trampled over them uh, so that he could become the resurrection and life for all of us. But John 20 actually continues. It says, Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now, this is kind of a strange story to read on Pentecost Sunday because usually we read the story of what happened in Acts chapter 2, which happens seven weeks after Easter. And you probably are familiar with that story. Uh, the disciples and Mary and the other women, they're, they're, they've been praying for days and they're all there together and the Holy Spirit comes and there's the sound of a rushing wind and there are tongues of fire and, and they all begin to speak in other languages. And they go out and they, they preach and 3,000 people are added uh, to their numbers that day. And that's the traditional story of Pentecost. But we have this other story in John 20 happening um, seven weeks before. And some people think these stories are in competition because here Jesus is giving them the Holy Spirit. And here seven weeks later, Jesus is giving them the Holy Spirit. But these stories are not in competition. They're actually very complementary. Because what we discover is that the disciples, like us, actually find that they need to receive the Holy Spirit multiple times throughout their lives. In fact, in Ephesians, it says, keep being filled with the Holy Spirit. Because, well, most of us find that um, our relationship with God through the Holy Spirit, um, it can sometimes grow cold, and, and often we need a fresh infilling of the Holy Spirit, or maybe a, a deeper infilling of the Holy Spirit um, as we go through life. And so that was what the disciples experienced, but, but here in John chapter 20, it's their very first experience of Jesus giving them the Holy Spirit. Now, one of the things that Jesus says here is receive the Holy Spirit. And so uh, it seems like the disciples have a choice. I mean, he, Jesus is telling them that they need to decide to accept that gift that he's giving them. And of course, that is our decision that we have to make as well. Is this a gift that we're prepared to receive? Are we prepared to allow him to have access to everything about us, to, to guide us, to lead us, to empower us. Do we, in fact, want to receive the Holy Spirit? Now, I'm going to be talking about what it means uh, to have him in our lives uh, over the next several weeks. That's going to be my summer sermon series, um, and so more of that uh, will be coming soon. But today, we're really focusing here on John 20. Jesus breathed on them. Now, uh, obviously, that was before COVID-19, uh, but this idea of breath is very central to Scripture because all the way back in Genesis, we, we see that God breathed life into that first human being. Uh, in Ezekiel, uh, you know, 
Ezekiel has to prophesy breath into those dry bones and bring them to life through the Spirit of God. And here, Jesus breathes on the disciples. You know, breath is such a precious, precious thing. And I know in my own life, uh, there have been times when I have struggled to breathe more than I do today. Uh, several years ago when I was sick, when um, paralysis was affecting different parts of my body, um, breathing was one of those things that I had a hard time with sometimes. I was never put on a ventilator, but taking deep breaths uh, was something I wasn't able to do for a time. And you really need to be able to take a deep breath uh, when you need to cough, when you need to um, yell, when you, <laughs> when you need to sing. Uh, those things require air. And let me tell you, when Joel was four years old, I really wanted to have the ability to yell, and I didn't have it. <laughs> and that was incredibly frustrating. But, you know, over time, of course, I have gotten a whole lot better. And, and now, um, while I'm not 100% what I used to be, um, my doctor tells me that I have a moderate, uh, moderate restrictive breathing defect, uh, which means I can do most things, but I probably can't run a marathon. And it probably also means that I don't need to be one of the people who gets COVID-19. The fact is, is that... Um, as a pastor, I have been in a lot of ICU rooms, and I have, lo I have watched a lot of people whose breathing was regulated according to the ventilator settings. And that's not something that I would wish on anybody. Um, that's not something I would ever want to happen to me personally, but it's also not something I would want to see happen to anyone that I love. That's one of the reasons why we're asking everyone to wear a mask next week when we start back worshiping in the sanctuary. Now I know that a lot of people aren't wearing masks and I know that as you go around town you don't see a lot of people wearing masks at all, but you know, as followers of Christ, we don't necessarily follow the crowd. Uh, in fact, often I think we need to be the ones leading the crowd. And so what we know is that according to the CDC, uh, they're asking churches when they come together to worship that we wear masks because while, um, while uh, often just talking to someone, there's not going to be a, a lot of danger there. But when you get 25 or 50 or 100 of your closest friends in the same room for about an hour and you're talking or singing or, or even just breathing, um, there's going to be some exchange of air and exchange of droplets. And so they're asking us to wear masks uh, to protect ourselves, but, but actually mainly to protect the people around us. And so that's something that we're asking all of you to do as well. Now, next Sunday, June 7th, our schedule is going to be a little bit different. So at 1020, we're actually going to meet outside, um, uh, out in the garden at the labyrinth, and that's where we're going to do our singing together. We're going to sing uh, three or four hymns together, um, and we're going to do that outside because um, all of the studies that the CDC has put out, uh, they have indicated that singing inside has more danger to it. So we're going to sing outside. That's also what our, our bishop has asked us to do. So we're going to do that at 1020 for 15 minutes or so. And then we're going to walk back in and sit down in the sanctuary. Of course, we will have every other pew marked off um, so we can socially distance a little bit inside. Um, but then at 1050, we will have our worship service inside. And we won't be um, belting out Amazing Grace inside, but we will still have some music, and we'll still have preaching, and we'll still have scripture reading, and, and we're still going to worship. It's just going to be a little bit different than what we've done before. Now, this is temporary. We're not going to be like this forever, but it's what we feel like we need to do for right now. Now, if you are not ready yet to come back and worship with us, you don't have to. You can stay home. You can worship online, um, and we will be uh, posting videos like we've been doing. It may be a little bit later on Sunday than what we have been, um, but they will be posted, and you'll be able to watch online. Now, again, please wear masks and socially distance. Now, I know that, unfortunately, we live in a very politicized world, and I, I just want you to know that 
us asking you to wear a mask is not because we're Republican or Democrat or because, you know, we support one political candidate over another one. I mean, we're really just trying to do um, what we think is safest uh, for all of our church members, but also because we think Scripture supports it. Um, In Romans 13, it says, let every person be subject to the governing authorities. And so if the CDC says that we're safest wearing a mask, then that's what we need to do. Um, In Philippians, it says, let each of you look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. We know, um, at least, you know, what they're saying is that uh, the mask protects us who wear them a little bit, but it really protects the people around us. And so putting their interests above our own means that we should wear a mask if it's possible. Um, In uh, Corinthians, Paul says, I have the right to do anything, you say, but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but not everything is constructive. So uh, he's talking about a different issue. But I think sometimes we get so wrapped up in, well, you know, I have a right not to wear a mask. Well, you're right. I mean, you do have a right to make that decision for yourself. But we're asking you not just to think about yourself, but to think about the people around you. And uh, he ends that with, no one should seek their own good, but the good of others. So again, we expect this to be temporary. I can't tell you for sure how long. Um, we're, we're relying on guidance from our bishop, but also the CDC and, and you know, watching, of course, what's going on here in Tillman County. Um, but we will uh, go back to completely normal as soon as possible. So let's go back to John chapter 20. When Jesus breathed on them, and he told them to receive the Holy Spirit, he was actually um, sending them out to do ministry. See, the Holy Spirit empowers us to do the same works of ministry that Jesus did, including helping people into a right relationship with God. And that's really what that last section uh, from John 20 is about. He said, if you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now, this is one of those verses that I have tended in the past to kind of skip over because what in the world is he talking about? There are a lot of different interpretations, um, but I always find that when Scripture can interpret Scripture, that that is the best way to try and understand these difficult verses like this. So here we have... um, If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. If you do not forgive them, they are not forgiven. Now, in uh, the old King James, instead of talking about sins being forgiven, it talks about the sins being remitted. Or um, another way to say that from the Greek word would be to say to let go. That if you forgive someone's sins, they are let go. And then If we say that sins are not forgiven, again, in the old King James, it talks about those sins being retained or, more simply, just held on to. So that's what Jesus is talking about, right? If you forgive sins, those sins are then let go. If you decide not to forgive sins, then those sins are held on to. And again, letting Scripture interpret Scripture, we have this story from Acts chapter 8. Um, and Peter and John had uh, gone to Samaria to do ministry. And while they were there, there was a man named Simon Magus, or Simon the Magician. And he thought it was really cool what Peter and John were doing with the, the works of power through the Holy Spirit, the miracles they were doing. So Simon the Magician actually offered them money because he said that he wanted to have the power that they had. Of course, um, you can tell by Peter's look that uh, he was uh, not happy with this request. And actually, Peter uh, gets pretty strict with him. He says, may your silver perish with you because you thought you could obtain God's gift with money. So Peter is super mad at Simon, and he doesn't offer him grace. He doesn't offer him forgiveness. He just says, you know, may your may your money perish with you. I basically, um, 
what Peter is showing us here is that he has been inspired by the Holy Spirit not to offer forgiveness to Simon, but instead to retain his sins. It's a very strange idea for those of us who aren't used to this. Um, But later on, we see, as you read through uh, Acts chapter 8, Simon does show some repentance, and and it's never really clear what happens with that. But at least here at the beginning, Peter seems to be led by the Holy Spirit not to offer that grace and forgiveness, but instead to call out sin for what it is. He's calling out sin for what it is. All right, so back in high school, um, I was not a cheerleader. Uh, I know that probably surprises some of you, but I was in the marching band. And so I went to all the football games. And I have to admit that I was never super interested in the football game, but I liked watching the cheerleaders. um, And I would try and cheer with them and and participate with them and encourage them because, you know, uh, we we tried to do things uh, together. And one of the cheers that I still remember, you know, 20 something years later, um, I'm actually gonna do this for you, so please don't laugh at me. Um, (laughs) But the cheer goes something like this. Yeah, yeah, we got the spirit. Yeah, yeah, we got the spirit. Yeah, yeah, we got more, 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 more. Okay, I know that my kids are now at home laughing their heads off, and it's okay if you are too. But that cheer was always so funny to me because we were talking about how we had all this spirit and, you know, we had more than, you know, the other team. And yet, we didn't usually win the football games. <laughs> you know, we, we celebrated that we had spirit, and yet that didn't, um, that didn't somehow make it onto the football field, right? I, we still lost more games than we won. And I'm afraid sometimes that that's what the church is like. We have these beautiful songs that we sing about the Holy Spirit. You know, we, we celebrate having the Holy Spirit. And yet, that doesn't always translate to our lives being different. That doesn't translate into us doing the works of ministry that Jesus himself did. And that's not the Spirit's fault. That's on us. And that's something that we got to step up and start doing the things that he commissioned us to do when he gave us the Holy Spirit. So we need to offer forgiveness. And we need to, in fact, retain sins. Call out sins for what they are when the Holy Spirit leads us to do so. Now, this week that I was planning to preach about this story from John chapter 20, this story about how Jesus breathed on them, I thought it was ironic. Maybe that's not the right word. But I thought it was ironic that in the news this week has been a story about breath. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, this is a picture of George Floyd. Um, he was a man living in Minneapolis, and he was arrested uh, for suspicion of using a counterfeit 20. Um, and in the course of that arrest, um, he was handcuffed uh, on the ground, face down, and a police officer um, put his knee on uh, Mr. Floyd's neck. Um, and even though you could, someone took a video, and even though you could hear Mr. Floyd saying that he couldn't breathe multiple times, um, the officer did not remove his knee, and Mr. Floyd ended up dying. Um, the thing is, is that we tend to come up with excuses about things like this. Um, we say, well, we don't know the other side of the story. Um, you know, accidents can happen. Uh, he shouldn't have resisted them, or even he shouldn't have broken the law in the first place. And I have to admit that I've said things like that uh, in the past, and I don't think it's necessarily because we are racist when we say things like that. It's because we are struggling to make sense of it. I mean, how is it that that someone can die like that? I mean, there's got to be a reason, because you know, generally we believe that police officers are decent human beings. And so there's got to be an explanation for something like that happening. And, and so we 
try to create those. Now, I want to say again, this is not about politics. Uh, yeah, as Christians, I, we can get involved in politics, and, and we can look, and we can advocate, and we can talk about um, you know, whether those police officers should be fired or whether charges should be brought up, uh, you know, all that kind of stuff. But I think as Christians, we can look at this situation and look at the fact that a man was accused of using a counterfeit 20, and he ended up being killed for it. And as Christians, we can say, that's, that's not okay. That, that is not okay. And with the authority that we have from the Holy Spirit, we can, in fact, say that is sin. And that is not okay. I don't know about you, but as a follower of Jesus, I consider myself pro-life uh, in every sense of the word. Um, you know, from conception to casket, from womb to tomb, uh, and everybody in between, right? So pre-born babies, um, uh, neglected toddlers, uh, uh, teenagers who are incarcerated, um, refugees who are in uh, crowded detention centers, um, people who are at risk of COVID-19, uh, police officers, and African-American men who can't breathe. I am pro-life across the board. And again, unfortunately, a lot of us who follow Jesus consider ourselves pro-life, but we're kind of like the cheerleaders again. We talk about, hey, we're pro-life, it's a great thing, but are we actually following through and doing the works of ministry that says, yes, lives are really important, and we're doing things to actually protect those lives. So I put this graphic on here for Joel because, you know, I, I kind of said some things about him earlier, but I want to say Joel is awesome, and he loves Spider-Man. And one of the best um, things in the Spider-Man movies, at least I think, is this quote that says, with great power comes great responsibility. And I think that's really what we got to understand, that when Jesus gives us the Holy Spirit, it's not to give us warm, fuzzy feelings. It is to give us power that comes with responsibility, that responsibility to offer forgiveness, but also to call out sin. And I think it's that last part that we really, really struggle with. I think in a lot of ways, we're kind of like Oprah. You know, we're like, you get forgiveness. You get forgiveness. Everybody gets forgiveness, <laughs> which is great, except that sometimes we need to hold on and say, wait, that's a sin. And we need to acknowledge that and we need to deal with it because there are consequences to that sin. So in the last couple of weeks, there have been several stories that have come out on the news Ahmaud Arbery, who was killed while jogging. Uh, Breonna Taylor, who was shot eight times uh, when police uh, came in uh, where she lived w without announcing. Um, and, of course, George Floyd, uh, who we've talked about. And you know what? I, I wasn't there when any of those things happened. Uh, they didn't happen here in Tillman County. And so, you know, in some ways, it's like, well, I'm not responsible. I, I don't have to feel bad about this. But the seeds of racist attitudes that lead to the acts of violence that have been on the news recently, the seeds of racist attitudes are here in Tillman County. And it's, it's something that we need to identify and call out because the attitudes themselves are just as bad as the actions in the eyes of God. I've been thinking a lot this week about one of my favorite high school teachers. Uh, he happened to be Hispanic, and he uh, told me a story one time of something that had happened to him. Um, he was, he was uh, detained by the police one time. They said that he looked like a robbery suspect who had been in the area. Now, um, he later found out that he didn't look anything like the robbery suspect, but he also wasn't white, and so they thought he looked suspicious. And um, not only was he detained, but he was put on the ground, face down, and the police officer put 
his boot on his neck. Even though that had happened a few years before he told me this story, he, that story was still very much with him. I, he was still angry about it. And as a 17-year-old white girl, I don't know that I got it. I mean, I understood, oh, well, you know, yeah, that sounds awful. But I don't think I fully understood the humiliation of that, the fear of that, and the danger of that. And even now, at the age of 43, I still don't know that I completely understand. But the more I see videos, the more I hear stories, the more I realize that this has happened to far too many people of color, our brothers and sisters. And it's not okay. So we need to call out racist attitudes as sin. We need to do that uh, in public forums. Um, you know, we need to do that on social media, and we need to do that in private conversations. Because, you know, as a pastor, I have had far too many conversations where people tell off-color jokes, or people will talk about those people. And, and I think, wow, if they're willing to say those kinds of things to me, <laughs> I wonder what they say when they're not talking to a pastor. Um, I, we all know people like that, right? And, and I think we need to call them on it. I mean, it, it's so many of us grew up thinking, oh, well, that's just uncle so-and-so. That's, you know, he's never going to change. Well, you know what? It's time that people change. It is time that we call people on it and, and we say it for what it is. It's not an off-color joke. It is sin. And we need to be bold through the Holy Spirit and call it what it is. You know, nobody is saying this is easy because, believe me, I know that it's not. And especially when you start throwing in all the things that, that people talk about, because we know that there's lots of good police officers out there. In fact, every single police officer I know seems like a really decent person. But we also know that there are some bad ones out there. And just because there's a whole lot of good doesn't mean that there's not some who are not good. You know, there are both peaceful and violent protesters. And I, I know that there are some very violent protests going on right now. There, there, there are buildings being set on fire, and, and that is not okay. That is sin. That is something that we've got to call out and, 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 and make sure that, that we say that. But that also doesn't cancel out the fact that the other sin exists. So often we talk about, oh, well, just because there's looting, you know, that kind of, you know, balances out the fact that a man lost his life for a counterfeit 20. Well, no, they're both wrong. <laughs> and so, again, we've got to be bold and call that out. But, you know, there are also peaceful protesters who are just trying to say we want to put a stop to uh, police violence. Uh, that's, not, that's not good. And we also need to say there are situations that do require lethal force. There are times when a police officer has got to draw their weapon, they, they've got to step into harm's way, and they've got to protect the public. And, and so we know that, that not every time someone dies uh, it, is it a problem, but uh, there are also times that it is. And so, so given all of that, I think Sometimes it's really hard for us to know how to talk about it, how to feel about it, um, how to just engage with other people about these really tough issues. So nobody's saying this is easy. But Jesus said that we're not doing this in our own power, right? When we receive the Holy Spirit, we are given power and authority to call out sin and offer God's forgiveness. We don't have to decide just based on our own opinions how to do that, when to do that. When we receive the Holy Spirit, he's the one that empowers us to do that. The way Peter did, 
right, when Peter called someone on a sin, but also when Peter went out and preached gospel grace. And so that's where we get our power. So we need to receive the Holy Spirit, not only for the issues that are going on in our world today, but for everything. We need the Spirit's power so that we, we don't just say, rah, rah, we've got the Spirit, but that we actually go in Jesus' name and do the kind of ministry that he did, calling out sin and offering forgiveness. Now, there is so much more that, that needs to be said, and, but I'm going to stop here, and we're going to pray. Holy Spirit, we desperately need you. Help us to examine our own hearts, to see those places in us where sin needs to be called out. Lord, we pray that you would give us boldness and wisdom to know when to call out sin in other people in other places. God, we're, we're scared of doing that. We're scared that we'll sound judgmental. We're scared that people won't like us. But God, hopefully we're more scared that we're not following you. Lord, we pray for peace. We pray for understanding. We pray for justice. And we pray for your kingdom to come. Come, Holy Spirit. Amen. All right, let's sing. have several announcements to let you know about what is going on uh, in the next week or so. Um, but first of all, in just in case you're watching this really early on Sunday morning, you might still have time to race to the church and join us for our short uh, Holy Communion service, which will be outside. Um, so join us if you can, or maybe if you just missed it. I'm sorry, but it was really good, I know. All right, <laughs> the second thing is uh, next Sunday, June 7th, we will have an outside hymn sing, like I was talking about earlier, uh, that'll be at 1020. Um, we'll sing for 15 or 20 minutes, but then give you time to make it over to the sanctuary. And our regular worship service inside will start at 1050. Um, now, there's no Sunday school, no nursery. Um, or we're just going to have worship, and it will be a little bit different than usual, um, but we will all be together. Please wear masks, and please remember to socially distance. All right, so we will have a, a special uh, greeter and usher training this Thursday, June 4th at 7 p.m. If you would like to help us um, by 
being a greeter or an usher during this time, uh, we would certainly appreciate that. Uh, we're not going to like train you to tackle people who don't have a mask on or anything like that. We're just going to learn how to be um, hospitable uh, during this time. Uh, number four is uh, join us for our Wednesday Zoom check-in and prayer. We're still doing that, and we'd love for you to be a part of that. Youth are going to be meeting on Zoom also on Wednesday nights, either at 7.30 or at 9, depending on what fits your schedule better. Uh, we're having a drive through baby shower coming up June 13th for Kaylin Grice. Um, if you need anything delivered to you, contact Wendy Howard. And please like and share our video. And uh, next week we will still have a video um, because we'll still have everything online. Um, it may not be at exactly the same time as it's been coming out uh, you know, in previous weeks. Um, hopefully, it'll be live streamed at 1050, the same time as our worship service here, but it kind of depends on the internet, to be honest. So, um, it may actually be uploaded uh, after lunch, but it will be uh, there for you if you plan on worshiping from home. All right, so let's have our blessing. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen.